So um, I'm the administrator of the DHS, but I'm also a PhD student in design history. So I'm here with a sort of different hat on today. Um, but this talk, it's a brief overview of my PhD research, which explores the work of two British learning disabled LGBTQ filmmakers, Matty Kennedy and Matthew Hellett. I use the term learner disabled as that is how Kennedy and Hellett self-identify. And it's the term the art organizations, which I research used to describe their remit, such as Carousel, and their sister film festival, Oscar Bright, of which Kennedy and Hellett are affiliated. And as you can see, on them, they use the word learning disabled on both organizations. Um, their films last up to about five minutes in length and focus on experimental LGBTQIA plus and learning disability subjects and frequently explore issues of gender and identity. I won't have time to show their films tonight, but um, just here are a few screenshots. Um, from Matthew Kennedy, that's a screenshot from two separate films, and Matthew Hallett from one, um, and that's Matthew Hallett's um, alter ego, Mrs. Sparkle. Um, tonight, I'll be specifically talking about my recent work in which I conceptualise their films as forms of craftivism. I have a background in design history, so working with short films has been very different for me in terms of thinking about how the films um, are as objects of design. So I'm in my final year now, but it's taken this long for me to understand what these films are and how they sort of fit design. Um, so my like, lightning moment was this thinking about films as craft and um, about from about a year ago. Um, and it was solidified by the, the last DHS student forum event, um, actually the last one but one, um, which was what is a design historian, where I believe it was Alex Todd who discussed um, what design meant to him and um, that an object, he said, can easily be a sort of tang tangible thing as well as a piece of code or maybe a pixel formation. Um, so that really sort of helped me solidify this idea of like film is sort of a form of craft in my opinion um so just some key terms first before i get started um i will use throughout the word amateur filmmaking in 1965 the experimental filmmaker maya duren wrote an article entitled amateur versus professional in which she confronted the negative tones and apologetic ring as she said that has typically surrounded the term amateur Darren illuminates the etymology of the word amateur, tracing its roots to the Latin word amatore, which translates as lover. So meaning one who does something for the love of a thing rather than economic reasons or for necessity. Craftivism is another key term that I use, coined by Betty Greer in 2003 to integrate her craft and activist practices. Craftivism is a way of looking at life where voices, which voices opinions through creativity and makes your voice stronger, your compassion deeper and your quest for justice more infinite. Greer explains that after crafts such as knitting regained popularity in the early 21st century, the idea emerged that instead of using solely one's voice to advocate viewpoints, one could use their creativity. So craftivism, I quote, allows those who wish to voice their opinions and support their causes the chance to do just that, but without chanting or banner waving. So here is the Craftivism Manifesto we created with a group of craftivists. Um, you might want to screenshot this right now just to read later. I will pick up on some of the key points in my concluding words, but I don't have time to go through it all now. But the Craftivist Collective also, they see themselves as what they call awareness raisers, hoping to provoke people to think. And they conceptualize craft as power and as a way of understanding current, current political possibilities. So at this point, it's just worth noting some et etymologies because the old English craft originally connoted power, strength and might. And as well, the German word for force or power translates as craft and the Ita Italian for power translates as ability. So power here, it's not related to domination or hierarchy, but to ability and capacity, so skills and practices. Um, for these films to be craftivists, I have to also argue that they're activists, and I do theorize the films as examples of visual activism, but in a more ambiguous context. So visual activism is a phrase coined by South African photographer Zanel Mohali to describe their own practice of documenting and making visible Black LGBTQI communities in South Africa. Mohali, um, who's on the left in this image, has stated, not everyone gets the chance to write their story. So I think if given a chance, we have a responsibility as a community to make sure that that narrative is out there and that it's accessible. Mahali hopes to inspire others to occupy space, to teach about their history, to reclaim it, and to encourage people to use artistic tools such as cameras as weapons to fight back. Mahali's work is located within the context of flipping the ethnographic and voyeuristic history of documenting people of colour and diaspora through the colonial machine and legacy which they argue must be achieved through self-representation and power. And I use the pronoun there because um, Holly identifies as non-binary. 
Brian Wilson um, understands visual activism more fluidly as a form of um, intervention, acts which disrupt the sort of business as usual status quo, if only briefly. Um, Brian Wilson sees Mahali's work as less immediately readable as activism in a narrow sense and understands activism as a word riven by ambiguities and considers visual activism that which confronts visual absences and active forms of visual erasure. So now to think of film as craft. The object of craft has traditionally been understood as a tangible object, often related to textiles, woodwork, glass shaping, etc. As mentioned previously, as technology develops an object, it can be argued can become a pixel formation or a piece of code. You may have come across the term hacktivism, which is a digital practice that has been contextualized as a form of craft, with several scholars arguing that binary computer programming code one zero was modeled on the knit pearl technique. Um, there are two interpretations of craft which seem completely opposed. So there's the definition which includes the skilled and experienced craft person who has expertise in a style, or it can be defined as the amateur or domestic arts relegated to the home or private sphere. Ultimately, insignificantly, whichever interpretation is used, craft is understood in its position as anti-capitalist, anti-mass production, small scale, the focus on the handmade, usually made by one person or a small team, distributed in the gift economy or undertaken for love, not money, which relates back to Maya Deren's earlier distinction between amateur and professional. So it can be argued the amateur film is created for love, not money. It is made and distributed in the small scale. It is therefore anti-capitalist and anti-mass production. It involves a degree of skill to use a camera, but is an accessible form that almost anyone can try out, particularly now as technology is developed and we all have sort of um, smartphones in our hands. The film is made by hand in the sense that the film object is the product of the craftsman filmmaking labour and that the camera and editing suite replaces the chisel or the workshop. The other significant overlap with traditional craft practices, be they skilled or domestic, is the community context they forge. So if we consider the professional understanding of craft, the craftsman's community was the guild who established, um, who established um, and met in their all guild, all on guild halls with their own rules in towns and cities. In the domestic context of craft, we can consider the knitting circle or the craft circle as the site of community building. In an amateur film context, the cine club can be interpreted as a ver their version of a craft circle, a space where membership of fil film enthusiasts who meet to share their work and learn from each other and inspire others to follow suit. So many of these craft circles, which have traditionally been held in person, now occur online via YouTube, Facebook and blogs, etc. More so since the global pandemic, but this has been increasingly the case for the last few decades. So I now want to argue that the films of Kennedy and Hellett are forms of digital craftivism. And to do this, I need to ask the following questions. How are they activist? How are they craft? How are they craftivist? And which community contexts do they foster? So in context of activism, if queer people represent a minority and face challenges in society, Queer disabled people can be said to represent a minority within a minority and will face different challenges to queer and non-disabled people. Additionally, learned disabled people face different challenges to physically disabled people, particularly in the context of sexuality, which still carries taboos. I believe the films of Kennedy and Hellard are activists in that they document and make visible queer learned disabled bodies and identities. Like Mahali calls for, Kennedy and Hellett are writing their own narratives and are using artistic tools such as the camera as weapons to fight back against the visual absence and visual erasure of queer, learned, disabled bodies and identities in media representations. So Kennedy and Hellett's films align with Brian Wilson's definition of activism, which is a form of intervention which, which disrupts the business as usual, the business as usual being non-disabled people controlling the narrative. These films are less easily readable as activism, but their activism comes in the form of occupying space and confronting visual absences. Craft has been understood as power and ability, and I argue Kennedy and Hellett's films represent power in the form of self-representation and ability in that they take control of the narrative. Advances in technology have changed our understanding of what an object is, so I argue their films are form, a form of craft. They are anti-capitalist and anti-mass production and ideology, they work against dominant practices of representation and they prioritize the small scale and the intimate to write an alternative narrative. The films, like traditional craft objects, imbue something of the maker and are conceptualized and disseminated through community and collaborative spaces. Their films are handmade individually in the case of Kennedy's early short or in small groups in the case of Hellet, using digital equipment in place of traditional tools. So how are they craftivist? The inherent activism and craft status of the films therefore represent a form of digital craftivism. While not directly campaigning for a particular queer or disability right, their films align with the more ambiguous form of activism. 
Whereas coining of the term craftivism calls for a use of creativity instead of just the voice to communicate meaning without the need for banners or chanting. Therefore, to return to the craftivist manifesto, the points that I picked up which align to Kennedy and Heller's films include raising consciousness, things that are made by hand, by a person, the sharing of ideas, adding to a dialogue, creating wider conversations about uncomfortable social issues, using their craft to help the greater good or in resistance to a greater societal ill, the connecting through, by and with craft and creating a more compassionate community, encouraging people to challenge injustice and find creative solutions, and reclaiming the slow process of creating by hand and thought with purpose. And importantly, they are part of a thriving community. Bratlich and Bush, who have written widely on craftivism in digital contexts, note the very connectivity of craftivism is a means of overcoming alienation. And alienation, it can be argued, is a bigger force in the lives of marginalized people, such as queer or disabled people, or in the context of Kennedy and Hellett, an intersection of both. Bratlich and Brush note how craftivist communities do not require organizing as a separate political activity, since it emerges from everyday life practices and it's tied to the DIY ethos and subcultural practices more generally. And um, so this is just a picture of um, a screenshot from um, a Matthew, an event called Matthew and Matthew, where Matthew Kennedy and Matthew Halley showed their films together at the Brighton Photo Vignali. And um, Oscar Bright featured Matthew Halley and Matthew Kennedy in a um, podcast with Grey, who are a disability theatre company and have been around for a long time. Um, so finally, just to finish off, um, when we speak of organisation in a craft of its context, um, Bratch and Brush say, it means finding affinity circles and social networks. The affinity circles and social networks forged and fostered by Kennedy and Hallett include Oscar Bright Film Festival, which can be understood as a form of a craft circle in so much as it brings like-minded people together to share work, inspire others to create and encourages collaboration. Kennedy and Hallett disseminate their work through social media platforms, which allows others to access their work. As Mahali says, it has to be accessible and hopefully to inspire other people to pick up cameras. Thank you. Uh, first, thanks to Jennifer, the Design History Society, and also the audience um, for listening to me today. Uh, I am a Brazilian graphic designer. I'm currently doing my master's here in Brazil at the University of Sao Paulo. And I'm calling this presentation Design Encounters because I want to make a reflection about how we as designers can learn from the experience of knowledge. And I will start with this photo which is the architecture and design school that I graduated here in Brazil. It is a federal university and located in a city called Belo Horizonte. Um, back then I won a scholarship um, by a Brazilian program called Science Without Borders. And I applied, I had the opportunity to apply for the graphic design course at Central St. Martins in London. And I was accepted and I lived in London during one year between uh, in an exchange program between 2014 and 2015. And those photos are just to demonstrate how those institutions are different physically. Uh, however, it's more important and to highlight how pedagogies, methodologies, approach to a problem and um, perspective, perspectives of what is design or not, and so on, were considerably different. And uh, while in Brazil, design is mainly seen um, as a scientific discipline, in the UK, the relation with the field of arts is definitely stronger. And I was learning a lot from this experience. Uh, hopefully my colleagues were also learning from my point of view. And back to Brazil, I brought back those two books. Uh, the first one is actually a catalog um, of an exhibition called All Possible Futures. I've got the All Possible Eros cover. And um, it was organized by John Sweder. And he uses a concept called speculative design to select the, uh, the works exhibited. And I know that this concept has been constantly criticized, but I wanted to show here anyway, because it was really important uh, at a moment for me. And I had the idea to mobilize uh, theories of history, some of them um, presented by this book, this other book here called Craft Design History in the Writing, published by Occasional Papers. 
um, edited by Sarah de Bond, the Catherine Tismet. And um, I wanted to un understand engaged practice. Uh, in my final no. project, I use this one uh, in order to understand engaged practice of graphic designers when dealing with uh, book projects. Uh, the project was called uh, The Book Sociability. Uh, I had also discussed those difference between Brazil and the UK design pedagogies that I mentioned here before earlier. Uh, and history again was helped me to inquire the past of design discipline in order to understand, mainly to understand our present. And I discovered that in Brazil there is a homogeneous theory among um, design historians that uh, institutionalization of the discipline of design discipline here was based in naive cope of the German School of Design called UN, that you probably know. And so in this perspective, the first school founded here in Brazil, in, in Latin America actually, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, called Escola Superior de Desenho Industrial, was basically a mural of the UN school. And this is my research now. Uh, I'm trying to understand uh, this sort of myth created about design in Brazil. And those are some articles that I collected, some articles published during the 60s of the last century that I collected from a newspaper called Jornal do Brasil uh, from Rio de Janeiro, uh, but with an, an important national circulation. And uh, as you can probably see, it's in Portuguese, but uh, the, the public discussion about possibilities of design education. And the idea of an industrial design um, was alive and uh, not just between Brazilians and also international personalities. Uh, it's important to say that in, during the 50s, uh, when Brasilia, the new capital of, of Brazil was under construction, all the personalities visit Brazil, such as uh, the Argentina Thomas Maldonado and the American Maya Shapiro. Uh, actually, this first uh, article here, uh, it is a discussion between Maldonado and Shapiro. Uh, they were discussing about the problem of artistic education after the house. And of course, they were discussing about art, architecture and design. Uh, but a good example to, that I wanted to show here today is Max Benz, a German philosopher who also taught um, at UN. He was invited by a Brazilian writer called Arudo de Campos uh, to visit Brazil, and he made a series of visits during 1961 and 1964. And in 1965, he published this impressive book called Brazilian Intellig Intelligence, a Cartesian reflection, and uh, he was sharing his experience about Brazil. And also Brazilians were published in Germany. This is, uh, you're seeing here the Hot magazine, Hot uh, publication, um, edited by Max Benz and Elizabeth Water. And uh, you're seeing the 39 edition written by Aloysio Magalhães in 1969 who was a very important Brazilian graphic designer. And also Arudo de Campos published in Hot as well. Um, here I have a quotation of Benz's book. It's a bit long, but I'd like to read together with you because I think it's important to understand what I'm trying to demonstrate here today. So, Design as a meditating modality of the external configuration of the world situ situated between technical constructiveness, artistic conception, and industrial production means for Brazilian intelligence an essential part of the idea of a future civilization. While the design suggests the future, it says goodbye to the past. One can participate in conversations in Rio, Sao Paulo, and Brasilia in which the idea of design emerges as a dialectical substitute for what in Europe we call historical consciousness. The design is generalized in a methodical and intuitive way 
and encompasses the whole concept of civil civilization. Well, I really like this quotation and um, I think that there is a deep ethnographic understand uh, of what was happening in Brazil at that period. And, and to finish, I would like to show this photo of Banks and Campos together in Stuttgart in 1964, um, arguing that we should look at the past, especially those moments, those encounters as moments of intensive exchange of knowledge. Um, like I told you here before, this GSM experience, when I went to London, I brought back with me my experience and my way of seeing what I had contact in a different place. I like to say that I, I appropriated those terms in order to engage them in my own context here in Brazil. And of course, we need to be careful and also understand um, conflicts, resistances, in order to analyze those encounters in a more complex way. Uh, but it's important to argue that Brazilians were learning from the difference and uh, Germans were also learning from the Brazilians' point of view. And the construction of this new industrial concept of design uh, should be seen through the eyes of collaboration and not just as a naive copy as written by many, by many uh, Brazilian historians in the past. Um, and that's it. Once again, thank you for your time. Uh, feel free to contact me and it will be a pleasure to, to talk a little bit more about what I presented here today. Thanks. As you can see, we have a, a fairly standard photograph of a bride and groom. Uh, the groom is in um, RAF uniform. And from this and the style of the bride's clothes, you can safely assume that this was a wedding that took place during the Second World War in Britain. The bride is carrying a rather large and formal bouquet of carnations with what appears to be a trail of asparagus fern, as well as a decorative silver horseshoe, which would be, have been given for luck. What's impossible to tell from this photograph is that the flowers, which were real as opposed to artificial, were a pale apricot, which matched the slightly dark apricot of the bride's dress. I know this because this couple were my mother and father, and the image shows them on their wedding day in February 1944. I think someone's got their mic on. Oh, how far we will cover a business on this. Hi, everyone. Hi, someone's got their mic on. Please. <laughs> okay. Um, Sorry about that, Felicity. That's all right, don't worry. Um, so the bouquet was made by my paternal grandmother in her florist shop in Dagenham, it's called Madame Olga's, um, from carnations that she had dyed specifically to match my mother's dress. As you can imagine, I grew up with this photograph, but it wasn't until I did a part-time NVQ, which is a, um, a qualification, a, a formal qualification in floristry, that I thought about the construction and design of this bouquet, because to create it would have taken a lot of skill and knowledge. To achieve the colouring, the orange, orange dye would have been added to water in which white carnations were left overnight until the colour reached the petals. Then the stem of each, let me just give you a slight close up, it's not brilliant, but the stem of each carnation would have been replaced with a thin wire, which would have been pushed into the head of the flower. And then that would have been tightly covered with flexible green paper tape. The individual wired blooms would then be assembled together with asparagus fern, which was also wired, and the trail attached. At the back of the bouquet, all the wires would be bound together to form a handle the ends neatened so they would not catch the bride's dress and covered with a ribbon. The skills involved were the same ones that I was being shown. I was being taught in 2003 at Southwark College, but I became curious about the history of this design 
which required cut flowers to be manipulated, essentially denatured and combined with non-organic materials to fit a specific aesthetic. After I finished the MVQ, I did some freelance wedding floristry myself while still working full time and retained his curiosity, but couldn't find anything well, very little written about the history of floristry, as opposed to histories of flowers and gardens. By 2014, I'd been accepted onto the MA in History of Design at the VNARCA, knowing I wanted to research floristry as a design practice. For various reasons, my grandmother, oh, sorry, um, for various reasons, my grandmother, who I never met, was the primary earner for the family and she owned both the floristry shop and a dance school in Dagenham in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. So how did a woman from a lower middle class background such as my grandmother become a florist? There was no history of floristry or gardening in the family. Why did she become a florist? Was it because floristry business offered a relatively secure income, which also satisfied some innate creativity. How key was her gender to this trade? She may have been self-taught using a publication such as The Practical Fruiterer and Florist, a complete guide on all matters relating to the retail fruit, flower and vegetable trades, which was published in 1936. And you can see here some of the, the illustrations where they're showing how to make funeral wreaths, where you wrap moss and wire around a wire frame. And this is the precursor to floral foam, which is used today. And then on the right hand side, you could see you can see the process by which a bouquet such as my mother's would have been created. At this point, in, in the Practical Fruiterer, there's detailed advice on setting up a floristry business. And it describes the pre-war business environment as comprising a good domestic flower production and a consistent public demand for cut flowers and arrangements. However, at this point, there were few qualifications or opportunities for formal training in floristry. Sylvester's School of Floral Art in Baker Street, London, described itself as the only school of its kind in England in a trade advertisement from April 33. And by 1935, Constance Spry, who's the subject of an exhibition at the moment at the Garden Museum in London, famous for providing floral decorations for aristocrats and society, had opened her modern school for flower work in Mayfair, London. However, neither establishment or any other school is mentioned in the practical florist, the practical fruiterer and florist. Hold on, just. So, and they were not, so it's not, they were not mentioned in the practical fruiterer or florist, which instead advised that although a florist could be self-taught, it was preferable, if possible, to undertake bench training with an established florist. As one might expect, the floristry trade suffered during the war. Growers were encouraged to produce food rather than flowers and supply chains were disrupted. However, by 1948, Angela Johnson in her book, Making Floristry Your Business, was able to recommend the trade as a newly sustainable career, particularly for women. Johnson also advised a period of bench training, but included Spry's modern school as an alternative. In fact, it was not until 1951 that a formal qualification was developed with the creation of the Society of Floristry curriculum. And this was subsequently authorized by the Ministry of Education in 55 and adopted by various technical colleges who taught floristry part-time to novice florists who were on day release from their employment in flower shops. At this point, the emphasis on training was explicitly gendered. For example, the floristry course at Croydon Technical College was part of the Dem Department of Domestic Studies, 
which was also referred to as the women's department in formal meetings. And it was taught alongside dressmaking, domestic science and nursery nursing. I know very little about my grandmother's floristry business. This is her. Um, no papers were kept after her death. And apart from the story of the dyed wedding carnations, the only other thing I know via my mother is that she would bribe grave diggers at the local cemetery to return the funeral wreaths, the frames to her once the funerals were over so she could reuse them. So thank you for listening to this explanation as why this family photograph is a very personal signifier of design history for me and how it continues to inspire me to ask questions about the material culture, praxis, gender and consumption within this field and its history. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for allowing me to speak at this wonderful talk. Um, I'm the kind of person that goes into a gallery and wants to figure out how something's made how it's hung, displayed, what materials a person used, why it is displayed like that, and to get close enough to see the smallest of details, to figure out the puzzles. As someone who's been a workshop technician for 12 years and uses sketchbooks, experimentation, creating samples, and physically touching materials to learn how they feel, move, and react, these are all key processes to how my brain learns. And I noticed that the more I went to museums and galleries, the more frustrated I would become seeing sculptures behind barriers too far away to see texture, let alone touch it, and books behind glass cases cut off from turning the page. Now, I know the reason for this and the decisions for this is one of preservation for future audience, yet I couldn't help but feel cut off from the whole point of the work, especially the function of a sketchbook or a sample book. Recently, another maker said, I make these mistakes so you don't have to. For me, this was the point of a sample book or a sketchbook, so that knowledge can be moved ever forward instead of simply being repeated. The decision of what page to display a sample book or a sketchbook was one that plagued me. Why is this page more important than the other 200 or so? What is what if there's an idea that's a lost idea or information that's a key piece of someone else's practice, just sat there waiting to be seen? It is these decisions I wanted to know more about. Between making practices and the systems of display, design history seemed to be a good fit for my curiosity. I could start to examine the decisions made for the many by the few and examine more closely the artisans that worked in these amazing ob objects, whose work informed the way we are make things today, even without many knowing their names. This has been reflected in my work, the work I produced during my MA, where my first essay looked at moulded leather cases from the 1400s, particularly trying to find out and replicate the process of making, which has fallen into obscurity. Being able to look closer at the, this object and hold them was instrumental in understanding haptic qualities of the cases. Small indents that you could see, but you couldn't see, but you could feel from where the cases were held and being used. My preconceived notions were blown out of the water and how they, the cases were handled on a daily basis. More recently, this has led me to my dissertation top topic of armature design within plaster casts, where I explore the internal structures of an in which are so intrinsic to the stability and longevity of the sculpture structure. Here on the left, you can see there's three artisans working on this a model of the hand of the Eiffel Tower. And there's so much work involved in it. There's wood structures and you can see the carpenters. Um, but there's also a little white figure who's the plasterer creating the shape and the folds of the cloth. 
so that the metal can later be molded around it. And yet that's not something that people necessarily think about when they think of the Eiffel Tower and its construction. And on the right, you can see the mold of a smaller plaster cast. So it's probably a half sized one and it's about 60 centimeters tall. And yet it still has this metal armature in, inside. There's no wood in this one, just metal. And that indicates that it's got longevity um, as part of its material makeup and the decision that's made of being part of the thought that this will last longer than the modelled wood armatures that you can see in the Eiffel Tower that were made for a temporary piece of work. The thesis has explored the design decisions within pedagogies of modelling classes that occurred during the setup of the government schools of design from 1837 to 1853. I researched the different artisans involved to provide, that provided the plaster cast examples to the school and later to the cast courts of the South Kensington Museum. And the people who were instrumental part of in, installing the work within the buildings, which were who were part of the Royal Engineers. Once again, I found myself studying something that's hidden from view, just like the pages in those sample books on the previous slide. This vast network of people, conversations, impressions, materials and forms have created and, involve, and evolved processes we still teach in workshops today. It is through this journey of design history that I've been able to objectively explore and realize the impact of these decisions and knowledge exchanges about making practices and have had a much longer lasting impact on the way sculpture is viewed and valued, especially those made of plaster, because it's such a cheap material and it's used as a stopgap for another sculpture, or it's used as an example or cast of a reproduction, that the value of sculpture made from plaster isn't as high as one that would be made from marble, for example. It doesn't have that intrinsic value of the skill. It's not seen as high valued as those that would be made from a different material. But it does have an instrumental value, especially in the the use within the government schools of design to heighten and to reproduce um, quality decorative arts and sculptures to heighten the taste of Brit British manufacturers at this time. The armatures within plaster subject is a subject that I hope to understand more and beyond my MA to trace the evolution of the armatures designs, the materials, the making practices through the ages, to fully realize the design decisions that were made and why. As I explained before, there's wood on the left-hand side for this model plaster sculpture, and yet there isn't any wood in the cast plaster sculpture. And part of that is for the longevity of the, thing, of the sculpture itself. One's temporary, one's seen as slightly more permanent or um, used to last slightly longer um, to transfer into a marble, for example, uh, using a pointer machine. But there's specific design decisions around those two materials and the structure itself. You, know, you can see how closely knit the wood is and yet how loose the wire is in the cast. So to understand the evolution, but also it's all my hope to identify the artisan signatures within these hidden forms. Can we identify who made um, all of the sculptures that were cast in plaster? Not the original artist, but those employed to create the plaster cast themselves. You know, because the casts are replicate, repl 
locations of the surface design. It's the internal structure where the artisans really sing. And while my research so far has concentrated on European origins, um, I do hope to expand this and look more broadly at designs globally within plaster sculpture and to learn more about the sculpture stories behind materials and its uses um, throughout the age as well as globally. That's my incredibly short talk, so I apologize. Um, but thank you for listening to my very brief journey um, into design history and I hope it continues. <laughs>